back in, in one minute, I just have to really bring biodiversity and climate change together uh, because we understand that we can only solve these issues when we work together. Climate change and biodiversity loss are two inherently linked global problems and we can only solve it by really collaborating and by not just thinking in climate change and biodiversity as separate issues. And that's what we're gonna talk about um, today. Um, we're very, very happy that we have the two younger focal points here with us, Ita and Marie Claire. And um, we will give you some different perspectives on how biodiversity and climate change are linked with each other. We hope this is going to be interesting for you. Um, we will try to answer all your questions in the chat as soon um, as we are at the end of the webinar and it would also be possible for you to ask some questions. Um, so we're going to have some, some discussions about what we're discussing here and I also very much hope that this is just going to be the start um, of a series of, of webinars that we're going to do on the linkages between climate change and biodiversity. So thank you so much for joining us and a hand back to Sweta and then I think we start with our first panelist. Yeah, so just to give you guys a quick intro of the uh, amazing panel we have here, uh, I can start off by giving my introduction. I'm Shweta Stotrabhasham. I'm the Global South Focal Point for the Global Youth Biodiversity Network. And uh, I would be largely facilitating this call and, and you know hearing from you guys at the end to see what you guys uh, think about and how you think we can work together between the, the two uh, important groups that are working in the field of environment, which is biodiversity and climate change. Um, so yeah, over to uh, you, Hita. Thank you, Shweta and Kristen. And welcome everyone. Good evening from India. Um, I am, as Kristen and Shweta already mentioned, Merkler and I are the two focal points for Yango. And so if for those of you who are not familiar with what Yango is, Yango is basically the youth constituency of the UNFCCC. So basically the, the youth constituency within the UN climate change process. We're a network of young people from across the world who ensure that youth voices are heard in the negotiations when decisions on climate change are taken, because the decisions that are taken on climate change for the next few years are going to affect our future first. And we feel that youth have a right to be at the same table where the negotiators are, because it is our future that we're talking about and our future is not negotiable. So Yango Works uh, is a flat structure, there's no hierarchy. We, the only two po elected positions every year are the positions of the focal point, and for this year it's Mary Claire and I. Um, and we have multiple working groups, we have more than 20 working groups. Most of them, of course, are active when we meet in session during the UNFCCC COPS or the intercession, which takes place in the summer. But a lot of them are active throughout the year, so we have working groups which are very, very negotiation-based, um, like for example, adaptation, mitigation, loss and damage, action for climate empowerment. But we also have a lot of trust cutting working groups like um, uh, for example, human rights or cities working group or working group on indigenous people. So it's, it's a structure which is open basically for young people to engage on topics that might be interesting to them or close to their heart. And we also have something known as the Conference of Youth and I hand it over to Mary Claire to talk about that. Exactly, to prepare young people uh, for the major conference, the, the COPS, um, we gather three to, to uh, yeah, four days in advance at the place where the COP is going to happen to give a space to young people uh, where they can um, connect, but also already prepare um, for, the, for, the, for the COP, but already can work on some strategies and um, on policy papers. So this is um, always happening before COP. This year, unfortunately, we won't have any COP, um, but the COI might take place virtually. We are planning um, this at the moment, and next year when COP is finally happening in Glasgow, we will have the COI 16 also happening in Glasgow. And my name is Mary Claire, as he already mentioned, co-focal point for Yango um, from Switzerland. Back to Sweta for the GYBN presentation. You're muted. Uh, yes, just give us a bit of it, just opening it up. Thank you for sharing it. Would you be sharing your screen, Christian, for the presentation? I think Christian is muted too. Okay, just give me a minute. Yes, what, um, I just have a very short presentation about us. Uh, 
uh, Swata, you're muted again. Yep, please go ahead, Christian. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, before we do this, maybe we should um, introduce our third panelist, which is Myrna. Yeah. Well, hi, everyone. Or shall I introduce myself? Or? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> well, hi, everyone. My name is Myrna. I am part of the GYBN steering committee for Latin America and the Caribbean. I am also co-founder of the GYB and Bolivian chapter, an environmental engineer, and my master's is on tropical biodiversity and ecosystems. So I am very happy to join this webinar because these are issues that are very close to my heart. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mona. Um, yeah, talking a little bit um, about the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, we are very similar to Yango. Uh, we are the official youth constituency under the Convention on Biological Diversity, the CBD. Um, but we're not just a youth constituency, we also see ourselves as an organization that supports capacity building and youth-led implementation measures on the ground. At the moment, we have 550 member organizations in 145 countries, and we have more than 40 what we call national and regional chapters, which are coordination platforms of young people that want to get active on biodiversity that are mostly active on the regional and national level. Um, in addition to this, we are bringing together around 669,000 youths from all over the world. Um, and we're running a program that is called Youth Voices. Through this Youth Voices Empowerment and Capacity Building Program, we are not just funding young people to participate in CBD meetings, but we're also um, organizing a series of regional workshops uh, where we do one week capacity building trainings on different aspects of biodiversity policy. We support our concrete projects that are led by young people and are happening on the ground. Um, and we're also um, publishing a number of publications. Our flagship is CBD in a nutshell, which is an interactive guidebook to the CBD process on how it works. And we're very proud because it has not just become a guidebook for uh, use delegates to the CBD, but also to negotiators that are attending meetings. So it's very useful. If you're interested in that, just head over to our website, gybn.org, and you can download CBD in a nutshell. Um, these are just like some of the few things that we're doing. If you're interested to join us, here are two links. Uh, you can either join as an individual member or as an organization. And if you have any other questions, then you're most welcome to contact Sweat Hunting. Okay. Perfect. Swata, you're Thank muted. You, Christian. Yeah, that was great. Uh, yeah, I think we would like to start off the webinar and go to our first speaker. Uh, Marie, I think you would like to, would you, would you like to be the first speaker for our panel today? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I am going to talk about uh, the importance of food systems, um, especially uh, and the interlinkages between biodiversity and climate change um, with a youth perspective, um, as we are all young here. Um, and this is also very important because next year we will have the UN Food System Summit. So the UN is really highlighting this, um, this importance of the transformation of our food systems. And it's a really, really crucial point um, when we talk about climate change, but also biodiversity. And very unfortunately, it's one of the most underlooked um, solutions, especially to the climate crisis, but also to the bio biodiversity crisis. So I will talk a little bit about this and give you a short input. Mm -hmm. So first, of course, it's very important that um, we as young people, we are the change. Um, we have been seeing this uh, very often and we are the agents of change. So it's very important that we as young people also um, understand better about the importance of transforming our food system as one of the major solutions already mentioned. And for this, it's very important for us to have a, a vision, to understand first the problems, but then have a vision, because this vision is then ultimately leading to action and also to results. And this is what we urgently need. Um, and I would love to see so many things happening, um, especially now also in this Corona crisis, um, in regards to our food security and our food systems. Um, but yeah, talk a little bit about what real food is um, and con to create this this vision. So it's really um, something which is pro produced um, as close as possible, uh, so very locally, um, but also that it's in a really natural shape, as you can also see in the background um, picture. Um, so where I'm coming from, we I'm living in the rural area of Switzerland, so we see a lot of this food, but 
sometimes when I go to the city, then you can't really find um, this uh, real food anymore, which is not processed. Um, but also that we really respect the human health, but also the animal welfare um, and other dimension as social justice. And of course, the environment, which is obviously linked to biodiversity and um, as well to, to climate. And also that it's really important that the food we are eating actually is nourishing us. And it's very um, weird to me, but actually we have a lot of food which has very, very few nutritions. So the food we are eating is sometimes not even really feeding us. So this is a short um, definition of the vision of what real food um, is. And uh, the food system obviously is then the whole path the food is traveling or how everything is coming together. Um, so it's really from the field or already starting sometimes before it's going to the field um, all the way to the consumption and as well very important uh, the post consumption so the, the waste and um, this is uh, also an increasingly big problem when we talk about uh, yeah, the climate crisis. Um, so what young people can do is, uh, is really about having the individual relationship to food again, so understand better um, what healthier eating is, and with this can ultimately transform um, how they are eating, but also um, leverage this on a, maybe on a university or school level, um, but also, for example, having more sustainable food at this international conference. For me, it's always very striking at the um, International Climate Conference to having food which is not really sustainable and climate friendly. Um, but also uh, really having an, an policy approach, an advocacy approach to transform the production of our food system towards a more regenerative way. And so it's no longer unfortunate enough to only transform your personal um, habits when it comes to food, but also have an influence on the bigger picture um, to, to, transform, to tr transform it on an even larger scale. So as already mentioned, um, the problem is that we have multiple emergencies. Um, one of them is the climate crisis and one of them is the biodiversity crisis. And that's also why it's so important to talk about the, um, these interlinkages. Um, and also that we have solutions to fix all of them. So it's not a lost case um, and we can make it happen and we can also make it happen very, very fast. And um, yeah, as already mentioned, um, it can be campaigns, but also um, yeah, changes on individual, but also governmental level is needed. So yeah, already mentioned, um, we from Yango work uh, on the climate crisis, then we have TYBN who is working on the nature part, biodiversity part, and um, in between we also have a crisis when it comes to hunger, inequalities, obesity, um, and also a lot of uh, non, uh, like different diseases coming with food. So we have this three um, like clusters interlink it, so the climate, the, the health aspect, and biodiversity. And um, yeah, you might know that our global food system is causing one third of global warming, the global warming greenhouse gases. So it's one of the major contributions to the climate crisis. Uh, so very often we hear a lot about mobility, we hear a lot about heatings, um, burning of oil, of course, this is all contributing but very often people miss out that um, our whole food system is causing so much emissions. And it's one of the things we can could easily transform if we want to do so. Uh, so this is why it's so important to talk about the food systems in the context of the climate crisis. Um, yeah, it's not really a part of, 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 um, of this webinar, but just wanted to mention that uh, when we talk about food, it has the same inequalities we are also facing when we talk about biodiversity loss and the effects of climate change on, on the communities. Um, so it's really a problem which is um, going also to the social, um, social sphere of, of, um, of this crisis. And then, as you might know, um, over 1 million animal and plant species are now um, threatened of extinction. And very often you have probably all saw um, heartbreaking pictures of um, burning down the rainforest, uh, that there's more space for food systems. And this obviously goes in line with the loss of biodiversity and uh, species. Um, and unfortunately, there are also reports that uh, we are in already in mid of the sixth mass extinction and as well the human species so us is um under threat so yeah i think this is enough urgency to see that we really have to do something with our uh food system and really transform um 
our food system. And um, let's go a little bit faster. Um, yeah, just wanted to mention that there are like so many um, different topics related to the to the um, to the to the food systems, as well as, for example, infectious diseases and epidemics. As we are now in, um, there are already a lot of linkages between why um, yeah there are more of these pandemics um, when we have when we are living very close to to animals, which are obviously then transmitting it. Um, but also it can be linked to, to climate refugees and um, civil unrest and also what we have been seeing now in the current crisis, um, the food insecurity, because um, very often people depend on the long food chain instead of producing locally. Yeah, so um, to say it in a, in a short, that um, we really need to change because this is how our current food system looks like and uh, this cannot be um, something we, we need for the future. Um, massive uh, industrial agriculture from livestock, as you can see here on the picture, is one of the major contributions uh, to, to the greenhouse gas methane, which is very, very harmful for the climate crisis, um, as well as some numbers. So the livestock um, supply, so mostly coming from cattle, um, is, is emitting, unfortunately, 40.5 um, percent of the world greenhouse gas emissions, so it's really a lot. Um, and when we want to stay below two or even 1.5 degrees um, to overcome the crisis, I've been mentioning in the beginning, we really have to change the way how we are producing food and especially livestock. But also very important, and I guess like we will talk later about it, is is very important that about the soil that the soil is very healthy. Um, that the uh, yeah that the soil can also um, absorb a lot of a lot of CO two and when we are losing um, this farmable land um, and as we have been losing one third of this farmable land in the in the past forty years um, it's leading to desertification and ultimately there is less biodiversity but also there is less capacity to grow food and it's very um, and also there is less capacity to absorb um, CO two which is yeah again bad for all the three um three crises so it's very important that we um that we um take care of the land and yeah try to make it even more fertile instead of um polluting it with for example pesticides or very extensive um cattle farming farming of course it doesn't have to be the way um and as already mentioned we have to um we have to transform uh, it's very um, good to know, or it's it, it, it's great that uh, that the soil itself can absorb a lot of carbon, um, the ones we are emitting, and the through the plants, but also the soil, um, it really takes a lot of carbon. So if we um, if the carbon goes back into the soil, it's very very uh, important for having a very um, fertile soil. So the carbon in this way is not an enemy of us. Um, it's just very. Um, has to be and if it's too much of like, the concentration is too much in the air obviously this is not it's not healthy but we need actually more carbon again back in the soil um, that it's healthy for uh, for our food system and it's also more healthy um, for the biodiversity of the um, different plants so um, healthy soil uh, is really leading that the plants are healthy that the animals are healthy on it but also obviously that we are healthy and um, our planet would be more healthy um, and yeah as you all obviously know um, fresh water and and, uh, and healthy soil is really um, something fundamental uh, for our human needs but also again for nature and the climate so it's there should be a way more um, focus um, on the soil when we talk about biodiversity but also in the climate negotiations and that's why I'm so happy that we next year have the UN World Food System Summit where we can focus especially on these different interlinkages um, and can really point it out and bring hopefully different agendas together um, because the, yeah, there is enough evidence that healthy soil is, uh, is very important when we especially look after it's also the product you might have um, you might often see like the tomato as you can see for example on the right side um, which is which is which was growing on um, not really healthy uh, soil and then it has also less nutrition um, and we very uh, little um, 
see like we don't really see tomatoes as the one on the right on the left side sorry yeah on the left side um the very red one which actually would be um how a nutritious uh tomato looks like so um it's very important and was what is then often happening that um in the whole food agriculture system they put a lot of um they process it they process the food first but also they add a lot of um um, additional uh, for example salt sugar or oil on fats and also package it very um, extensively and add uh, flavors or colors um, that it looks more appealing as we actually wanted to have the food um, but with this obviously it gives the negative feedback um, loop back uh, and is obviously even more threatening um, um, threatening the biodiversity so it's very important that when we as individual but also um maybe if we can influence the very the place where we are working or the university that we are looking on the on the labels and um yeah try to shop food as locally as possible uh but also really check what are the ingredients um are there um are there any numbers you are not familiar you can find all the information of, of course online but also um yeah try to um, reduce the plastic um, packaging, try to um, buy food um, obviously um, as open as possible that there is less um, packaging which obviously afterwards is leading uh, to, to waste again. And when we talk about biodiversity as I've been already mentioning in the, in the, in the intro, um, unfortunately very often the, the land was first um, rainforest or, or any other forest and then um, often the land gets deforested at the that the it can be used for farming um, but unfortunately after and very extensive farming after several years the land cannot be used um, so it will very often be um, put like on bare land and there it's very important a lot of um, organizations are already working I don't know if GYBN is also working it but I think you have a lot of organizations working um, on this is like reforest this bare land um, that there can be an F, there can be again like a forest so there are a lot of organizations um, who are focusing on reforestation so this is another um, this is another activity young people can be engaged in um, to combat the climate crisis but also doing something on biodiversity there is obviously very important to check what trees are going to be planted um, but yeah, there are like for sure local groups who have an in-depth understanding of what trees are are needed, so that the, that the soil is never um, bare, because this um, again leads to desertification, and this is yeah not good for the climate and not good for the biodiversity crisis. So moving a little bit, as we're already quite late. Um, but yeah, obviously then when you have um, yeah growing plants, it um, absorbs quite a lot of CO2. Um, so we have more um, carbon sequestration, which is um, one of the, yeah, is actually the number one solution to the climate crisis. Um, and obviously also makes the water more clean. So um, reforestation is a really, um, yeah, good activity with we as young um, people can do. And it's also it's very important is that it's one of the cheapest solution. We don't need any high-tech solutions for this. Uh, so a lot of people can engage, but also with a small budget, which is very important, especially for um, weaker economies. And it's also um, important for resistance, flood resistance, also fire or drought. And um, also now we are in the decade of ecosystem restoration. So it's also contributing to this, as you can see, uh, yeah, having healthy um, agriculture and also um, the, the reforestation aligned with it um, can really increase uh, on a lot of different agenda, um, obviously also the increased biodiversity in, in the forest. So um, closing uh, with what we need, uh, it really needs more public awareness and education on the topic of the importance of transforming our food system. Um, we need to have a complete view shift from a very um, extractive agriculture towards a regenerative um, local production engaged with the pe like engaging people but also really taking care um, on biodiversity aspects but the second one as already mentioned um, we really need the government working on on this side 
um, as they, for example, have can give subsidies to farmers who work on an um, organic, regenerative way. Uh, so we have to um, engage with, with politicians um, or me, maybe even become a politician ourselves and advocate more for um, redirected subsidies for farmers, um, for more healthy food campaigns, but also that public institutions um, are, yeah, actually selling or um, cooking with healthy with healthy um, food components and also that the government sponsors and um, supports projects which are towards this uh, yeah new vision of, um, of of a healthy food system and the third one is really having um, a farmers community and a community of farmers who want to be part of this change and don't see it as a as a threat to them um, but yeah yeah, having like a support system and teaching and workshops um, amongst the farmers. Um, and I think like the, the last part is really, we don't have time to do this step by step, but we have to bring it all uh, together. And this might be a challenge. Um, but I think now to the lead up to the UN Food System Summit is a brilliant agenda. We can all work together from the um, from the climate um, perspective, but also from the biodiversity perspective, also from the inequality, hunger, food perspective. So I think this is, yeah, brilliant that all of this comes together. And with this, I hand over. Thank you. No, that was amazing. I mean, the, I totally loved your uh, presentation, Marie. It was really nice. And I, I think I have a lot of questions myself that I would like to discuss with you and hear more on. But uh, your uh, presentation is perfectly sequenced uh, for our next talk, which is from uh, Mirna, which is about uh, the Amazon forest fires and ecosystem restoration. Uh, so just before we get on to that presentation, I would just want to ask if anybody here has any questions, like really burning questions you would like to ask the panelists. We will definitely get back to a nice Q&A at the end. But if there is anybody who has any question now, um, so we have one question here, uh, Marie, uh, do you, can you see the question? Yeah, maybe you could answer the question first and then we go into the next, uh, uh, to the next panelist. Uh, yes, I can share the slide. Oh, there is a question over there. Okay, um, I, I don't know if there is any um, platform where you can view the, like what um, plants are suitable for the environment, but I think it's, like even if you have this on a national level it's very hard because um like for example in switzerland we have a lot of mountains so higher up in the mountains obviously um the the plants will be very very different but it can be even like in on the same attitude if there is maybe a lot of sun or if there is like more water it can be very different so i advise you to check if there is a local organization maybe plants for the planet um but there are also like a lot of other um um yeah organizations maybe even a gybn chapter um can assist you with this and so i think this will be yeah the best that also the the trees then or the plants are surviving um yeah i guess this is yeah like really check with the local teams i think this is the best um back to sweater perfect uh the, the, we just have one more question and then we move on the next question we had is how can change in the food systems uh, lead to uh, climate action okay yeah, so as already mentioned, um, if we have a more regenerative and also sustainable way of farming, um, we can reduce uh, the CO2 emissions. Um, so really on the, on the side of having um, less bare land, having um, less livestock, um, which is contributing with the methane, but also having more um, fruitful and more farmable and fertile land, which is um, yeah, using a lot of carbon um, from, from the air, so carbon sequestration. And this leads to very, very cheap climate action um, and very, very massive climate action. So it's really the, I would say the, the golden bullet <laughs> to, to take climate action is transforming the food system. And I will share the, the website and all the slides um, in the chat box in a few minutes. Perfect. Thank you so much, Marie. Uh, yeah, you, your presentation beautifully sequenced into talking about ecosystem restoration and the role it plays. And um, Mirna is gonna give us a highlight on uh, the the recent Amazon forest fires and how uh, ecosystem restoration work is connected to that and uh, the topic in general. So over to you, uh, Mirna. Okay. Thanks a lot. I'll start sharing my screen. 
Okay, let me know if you can see my screen now. Not yet, it's just, uh, it's gonna start. So I think it's like, uh, once it shows up, I'll let you know. Okay. Midnight isn't yet showing up. Do you want to start the presentation or like share it with me and then I can show the slides? Okay, I'll try to do that then. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we do have a few questions here in the live chat that were posted. Uh, Marie, would you like to like take some of the questions from here too? I think the first one we have here is, do you really think we have to consider habitat uh, suitability studies for crop cultivation? Uh, so actually we don't only have to uh, study um, the current situation but also incorporating the future which um, can be drastically changing from the place where you're living due to the climate crisis. So it's again like, um, yeah, actually a, a negative feedback loop that, for example, if we have crops here also in Switzerland, um, where we are, there is a lot of farmland and we have a lot of um, fruit trees and they are not blooming now because the bees are not swarming at the same time because it's too cold for them. And so the whole, um, yeah, like this, the balanced system and the adjusted system is getting out of balance. Um, so it's not only very important to check what locally grows best, but also incorporating future perspectives um, to see what uh, what is happening if it's getting one and a half, uh, when, it, when it's getting half a degree warmer. And now I see the slides are here. Um, yeah, hand over. Oh, perfect. Thank you for that. Yeah, over to you, Mirna. And uh, guys, we'll come to, we'll definitely discuss all the questions and have a very lively discussion at the end. So please uh, do put, uh, post your questions as and when you get them. So that we have them logged here. Thank you. Um, Milna, okay. you can see your screen, so yeah. you don't need to um, yeah, down, send me the presentation. Thanks. Oh, you can see my screen already? Yes. Nice. Nice. Presentation, so you can just, uh, yeah. Okay. Then I'll start. Uh, well, uh, thanks a lot, Marie, for your presentation. I am happy to, to continue on that line because I will talk a bit about uh, a more local uh, perspective from what happened with the recent forest fires in the Amazon and a bit about ecosystem restoration pathways that we can follow uh, and what happened to, bio, to the biodiversity that we lost. But this is very linked to, to the food systems actually. So it will be good to, to talk about this now. Uh, I'll start talking a bit about the Amazon and the links to our climates. And maybe many of you have heard about the Amazon rainforest as something like the lungs of the planet. Uh, but this is not really true. <laughs> what a climate scientist now uh, says is that it is better to think about the Amazon rainforest as a major carbon sink more than the lungs of the planet because uh, the forest indeed uh, produces oxygen, but it also needs the oxygen to breathe, like the trees need the oxygen to breathe, and yet the, car the oxygen uh, production is almost neutral but the carbon is not because it actually absorbs around a 5% of the carbon that is emitted. About like from the 40 millions that is emitted in carbon dioxide, the Amazon rainforest absorbs 2 millions. And this is a lot for the, for the whole balance of the system. 
Um, as can you see in this map, uh, you can see the biomass uh, that is linked to the potential of carbon sequestration of the Amazon rainforest. And you can see that the biggest uh, potential of uh, sequestration, the biomass, is uh, near the Amazon basin. So it is very linked to, to the forest that is uh, near to the Amazon basin. But uh, also, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, burning of the Amazon trees, uh, and lately it is increasing. So it is estimated now that the burning of the trees in the Amazon rainforest uh, and well in, in the forest in global uh, it accounts for at least 30% of the global carbon the carbon emissions. And this means that uh, when we have a uh, rainforest fires, we we can totally change the picture of a carbon sink and we can convert the forest into a major carbon emission source. And that is something that is very worrying because uh, all the carbon that is stored in the in the in the trees for years and years, maybe millions of years, now it's going back to the atmosphere in an unprecedented rate, and uh, it is very complicated to to measure how much it is, but it's definitely causing a major imbalance in the ecosystems. Uh, so I am sure that uh, most of you saw. Uh, in because uh, the Amazon fires of 2019, as the, the forest fires in 2019 that were spread all over the world, not only in the Amazon, uh, were very heavy last year and they were in all the international news. Uh, they were very heavy in many countries of the Amazon, especially Brazil, Bolivia, Paraguay, and a bit of Peru. Uh, and they were really devastating and people were not prepared, the governments were not prepared. Um, so this was a major drama <laughs> and crisis. Uh, and as you can see on this map, um, we have here mapped the main hotspots of the forest fires in 2019 uh, in red. And the deforestation hotspots here are mapped in yellow. So you can see that there is an overlap of deforestation and fire in most of the cases. So this means that almost all of the hotspots of forest fires happened in areas which were uh, areas that were deforestated, deforested previously. So there is a strong link between deforestation and forest fires. And this is something that uh, some governments still deny <laughs> because they say that it is a natural process. And it is true, forest fires are part of a natural process. They happen every year, but they happen more in deforested areas. So when we have deforestation scenarios, it is almost definitely like for sure that we will have forest fires in this area in the next year. And this is why they are increasing. And this is why this is very uh, linked with the politics. Uh, so the, the policy decisions that every country uh, has uh, with regards to the forest uh, conservation actions or, or forest management actions are going to have a direct impact on the forest fires. A clear example of this is Brazil, sadly. Uh, the president of Brazil is a strong supporter for agribusiness uh, since the beginning of uh, his mandate. He was against several organizations trying to safeguard the Amazon rainforest, that's where I found, uh, also against indigenous tribes that are the the stake guards of the, the Amazon rainforest in this country. He incentivizes farmers to, har to farm more livestock and soybeans, promoting large scale of burning of forest areas. So these are intentional burnings. And he also, during the, the year of the forest fires, he cut the funding to the National Environmental Agency, which was the main responsible of uh, providing the resources to regulate the interior of the country. So this is what led to this larger scale of unregulated forest fires, because at the end uh, they they went out of control, and uh, everybody uh, made a, a, a big condemnation of uh, of these policies of Jair Bolsonaro by multiple environmental agencies and foreign nations. Uh, but Bolsonaro suggested uh, that non-governmental organizations were uh, setting these forests these forests ablaze. To discredit the government, so he is like blaming civil society and uh, and NGOs 
uh, for everything what happened, while the link between his policies and the forest fires is very clear. Something similar happened in Bolivia. Uh, Evo Morales, the previous president, uh, he, he, in the international arena, he has been always been a strong advocate of the rights of Mother Earth and Pachamama. But uh, in the ground, he had a very close relationship with the agro industry and the cattle industry sectors of the country, which are very dominant and uh, usually go against the, the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities. He released a package of laws which were incentivizing deforestation and forest burning at the beginning of the year. Uh, I won't mention the extent of the laws but uh, they were authorizing forest clearing, uh, they were uh, promoting ethanol and biodiesel, and um, this led to, to massive uh, deforestation. And when the forest fires were occurring in Bolivia and all the civil society were uh, trying to get help uh, from other countries, he denied to issue a declaration of national disaster by a Supreme Decree. And this is the kind of law that will have allowed to activate emergency protocols and receive international aid. But because his government denied it to, to issue this declaration of national disaster, we weren't able to receive the, the planes and the, and the donations and everything because the national protocols didn't allow. Uh, also, just before the forest fires, uh, his government signed contracts for meat exports to China, and we know that this incentivizes a lot the expansion of the cattle industry uh, that, that happens by forest burning without uh, the appropriate control measures. How much biodiversity did we lose? Uh, I am sorry to say that I cannot uh, answer to this question because nobody does. <laughs> The problem is that the losses are uh, incalculable. Just to say, like, if we uh, consider 500,000 uh, hectares of burnet forest, it represents, in economic terms, $1,140 million. But this is just the economic amount. But the biological diversity and ecosystem services uh, Losts are not easy to calculate because many of these forests were pristine forests in conservation areas that were not studied enough yet. In Bolivia, for example, the most affected ecosystem is called the Dry Chiquitano Forest. This is a kind of endemic ecosystem that only exists in Bolivia. And uh, we think that in these forests, we had uh, 1,200 species of vertebrate animals and others, but from this amount, we only knew 20% of the richness. So more than 80% of the species that we had in this forest were not even known to science because there, were there was never the funding nor the resources to study the biodiversity that we had in this ecosystem. So the, the uh, research and the or non-governmental organizations were doing their best to try to study and understand this type of forest that is very special and then we lost it <laughs> due to the forest fires so we don't even know how many species we lost and this is something that it's very hard to to know but it's important to understand uh, and well uh, can we restore it a uh, fully restoration is not possible in these areas because we don't know which was the previous biodiversity state, so we, not, we cannot know how to go back to this state. But in general, uh, ecosystem restoration is never a, a fully effective, uh, that we don't, we don't uh, reach 100% restoration results because it is not possible to go back to original ecosystems. What we can do is try to facilitate to recover some of the ecosystem functions and the ecosystem composition that we had before. And we have to do it as with um, taking in consideration uh, all of the possible approaches that we can take and try to deliver the best results based in what we need. Uh, so uh, to design a restoration strategy, we first need to ask ourselves which focus we are going to have 
if our focus is on the forest structure and the connectivity, we will lead to, uh, to some kind of restoration. But if we, our focus is more on the ecosystem services and the livelihoods and the people that were living in the forest, we will have another uh, kind of approach. So for example, if we need a forest that is important for the livelihoods of the people that were living in the forest, we need a productive forest that will help us achieve the human needs. And then we will need restorations, uh, interventions that will focus on silviculture, agroforestry, or maybe commercial monoculture plantations, which will lead to a kind of forest that delivers services that provides food or provides other uh, services like shelter or water uh, management systems that are improved. So they help the people. But in the case of the forest fires in the Amazon, most of the ecosystems that were lost were uh, pristine forest ecosystems that had a more conservation interest. And what we need to restore here are the connectivity uh, uh, functions of the forest, so we can allow the movement of the wildlife between forest patches. Uh, and we need to uh, think about re restructuring uh, the forest uh, that we had before, the ecosystem functions for the wildlife and the biodiversity. And uh, in this case, we need to focus more on uh, assisted natural regeneration, which means um, most of the time passive restoration. And we are, and if we are going to do active restoration interventions, only uh, they will need to consider native trees and not uh, trees that belong to other ecosystem. And this is, um, uh, and it, this is because the most of the species in these ecosystems that are used to recurrent fires have resilient seeds that are a resistant to fire. So even after a fire, most of the seeds of some species will come back if they are not disturbed. But if we have a restoration approach that is bringing in exotic species that are not native to this kind of forest, even if we think that they are from the same family and they will do so more, more or less they will be similar to what was there before. They will compete with this species and they will not be able to, to, to grow out of the seeds because they will have competition. So the best approach here is to not touch the forest after a forest fire, to declare, to declare priority conservation areas, close the areas and let the nature re regenerate itself. And uh, this is very important because uh, many governments of the countries that were affected by these forest fires now are targeting international uh, sources of funding to start restoration um, activities without taking into account these kind of things because they are just after the funding. And it is very likely that they will start these restoration approaches uh, doing more harm than good to the pristine forest that was there before. And just for you to see, then, this is a graphic on, uh, about uh, how much forest cover we lost in the, in the fires. The red columns are the, uh, the, the, the forest loss that we had last year. The blue columns are the forest loss that we had uh, during the same period of forest fires of 2018, which you will see, like, in general, is much smaller. And in the... Uh, green columns, you have an average of the forest fires that uh, led to forest loss in the period of 2001 and 2018. And you will see that it is very similar. So this is not something that only happened last year. It's just that last year we had major media coverage. But this, is happen this has happened more frequently and more intensively during the last decade. And that is why we know that they are going to come back. So we are uh, almost uh, approaching the dry season of this year, and we know that the forest fires are starting to come back. So the question is not if they, if they are coming back, the question is if we are ready. Uh, and what can we do as young people uh, to, to help avoiding uh, the negative impacts of these forest fires? Because we know that, yeah, we will try to, to join the restoration efforts, but most important than restoring, uh, we need to try to avoid uh, as much as possible. 
uh, these kind of negative impacts. And I will make uh, I will mention a quick list of things that uh, young people can do. Uh, there are for sure many more things, but this is just for you to give you an overview and and send a clear message that it doesn't matter where you are or uh, which are the capacities or the reach that you think you have, you can always do something about it. So first step, uh, stay informed. Uh, not only about uh, what is happening on the news, but uh, stay informed on which are the underlying drivers of deforestation and these forest burn practices. As you can see, there is a lot of politics behind this. Uh, also on the impacts of the forest fires for the local communities in these countries. Also try to know what science and the academia says about this, because most of the times it's totally different than what the press says and what the government say. And also be informed on what actions are indigenous people, the NGOs and the civil society movements behind the forest conservation are taking, because most of the times they are asking for help and you can join. A second step, push your governments. It doesn't matter where you are. <laughs> if you live in an Amazon country, a strong for a push for a strong regulation of agribusiness and cattle mega industries, push for forest protection institutions and the legislation strengthen it, push for development policies that benefit the local communities in the Amazon, which are not based in extractivism, and for some research before implementing any restoration strategy. This is very important. If you don't live in the Amazon, support a party or politician that makes the Amazon a priority because this is important for the whole planet's uh, stability. And uh, urge your elected representatives to block trade deals with countries that destroy the forest and provide support for the countries that expand recovery. And again, expanding to recover in the good way, like involving the academia as needed. At the personal level, uh, I would say the most important thing is to be a responsible consumer. And this is very important and very linked with what uh, Marie has said before. Because the world's demand for beef, soy, and timber, and minerals and other products are the most uh, linked to the deforestation. So think twice before <laughs> you eat meat definitely but uh, if you're going to eat meat uh, ensure that you are eating meat uh, that is locally sourced and doesn't come from uh, and it's not imported from a rainforest country because uh, it is for sure that you are incentivizing deforestation and the cattle industry that is going against the amazon conservation and against indigenous people's rights uh, think twice before you buy another smartphone, for example, because this is all also very uh, linked to illegal mining in the Amazon basin. And uh, in general, think twice before you, you consume or buy any other new good that is not essentially needed for you. Uh, then support uh, as you can when needed. And during the, the crisis of the forest fires, we had major uh, protests all around the world, uh, asking for the governments to take uh, bolder actions against it and um, abolishing uh, the laws that were causing these kind of disasters. Uh, so for sure, we will do more and we will need more people supporting. So if this uh, leads to a global movement, it will be easier to push our politicians a volunteer if you cannot volunteer on the ground as many of our people did like going uh, as volunteer firefighters and combating the fire by themselves you can support with donations they can be in kind or they can be monetary donations because it's always needed especially for the equipment of the volunteer firefighters because they were not ready and they will not be ready this year either we know uh, you can help a uh, with donations, we can help with campaigns. You can oh, you can even help with art. We have a massive uh, support from the artist movements uh, to spread awareness of the urgency of this situation. And last but not least, uh, wherever you are, fight for indigenous rights, because uh, it is not only a uh, something rhetorical. It is not poetical. It is true that indigenous peoples 
uh, and local communities uh, and native communities are the most important uh, um, people uh, who is trying to protect what is left from the Amazon rainforest. And uh, I can show you that on this map <laughs> that uh, shows the distribution of the total uh, above ground carbon storage in the Amazonia. And you can see that uh, most of it is overlapped with indigenous territories, even more than with natural protected areas. So uh, it is possible that uh, supporting the governance uh, of indigenous peoples over their territories is a more effective strategy than the design of new protected areas that are managed by the governments. I think that's it from my side. If you have any questions, I will be happy to, to respond. <laughs> and uh, thanks for your attention. Uh, the main message I think is that the forest is one of our best alliance against climate change. And uh, the Amazon is home for a big, big percentage of the species that we have in our planet. So it is uh, definitely climate is at the stage, but it's way more than climate. Biodiversity is, is also at stage. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Mirna. I think uh, it, this, your presentation really made us rethink a lot of things and uh, actually understand a little more in depth of what's happening in the Amazon and, you know, uh, a more depth, depth about what is happening with the forest fires and how restoration work can really happen and how can people from across the globe support. So thank you for giving us that overview. We do have a lot of questions from people. And uh, I uh, just want to let you know that we will be logging in all the questions you've given in the open session. Uh, just uh, I'm going to come quickly to the per some of the questions that I'm guessing are more burning and they've been put in the chat. So the first question mm -hmm. I see here, Mirna, is um, uh, I don't know if you can open it as well. It says, yes. uh, yeah. Can there be any political intervention on massive deforest uh, on massive deforestation in Brazil in view of the fact that the last fire was started in order to uh, carry out soy plantation since uh, it became the first country in the world to export soy? Yes, and I think that uh, the answer is in the question, <laughs> definitely. So this is, uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the political intervention uh, intervention is that the, the policies have to change drastically. So uh, we need to, uh, the, the laws in Brazil to stop supporting and incentivizing deforestation for soy plantations and cattle industry. And that will, be a, that will lead to a massive change in, in the forest fires this year. We are not very optimistic about <laughs> the decisions that Bolsonaro will take, but still we need to push. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I think, yeah, uh, Devika later has also mentioned the same thing you were saying about political intervention being an effective way to reduce it. So thanks for mm -hmm. that. The next question we have here is how uh, effectively can young people push their governments to act while maintaining that uh, the same energy? As we all know, politicians will take, uh, will take up an issue after repeated uh, calls. Well, <laughs> this is tricky. Uh, it is always difficult and it will always take a lot of time to see a change in, in the government. Uh, what is for sure is the governments react to two things, uh, funding and votes. So if you show that the most important or, or a big fraction of your voting population is going to go against you if you don't change a certain policy, then for sure the government will change their minds. So something that young people uh, works at best is at raising awareness at massive levels through social media. So I think that our biggest role is this, to try to change the perspective of the voters, trying to spread this information as widely as possible. And then if this perception is easy to see for the government, then they will change the policies because they don't want to lose power. No, that, absolutely. Um, so we have a lot of questions in the Q&A uh, part. One of them I can definitely answer is we will uh, share the presentations with you guys. What we will most likely do is we will put a link uh, on our uh, on our page or Facebook page or somewhere where you can like view these presentations online. So all of you get an ac get access to it. 
Um, uh, the other questions I think we could come to later once we are uh, done with our, with our presentations. So the next one is going to, the next panelist, uh, Hita, is going to dive deeper into the wildlife uh, scenario and the role that wildlife and biodiversity is playing in the climate crisis. So over to you, Hita. Thank you, Shweta. And uh, thank you, Mirna and Meghle, for those amazing presentations. From what I'm going to say, a lot of it is not necessarily very new information, but the reason I'm going to mention it is because sometimes we take information for granted and we forget to act on it. And what we need to see is we need to see action, whether it's from people within the space who are working on climate change and biodiversity related issues, or whether it is someone who's completely from a different uh, field of work. Because at the end of the day, we have something which is a crisis, which is um, you know, is questioning our uh, human survival. And I think it is everyone's duty to take action. So I'm just going to quickly share my screen. We're going to be talking about the role that wilderness plays in uh, fighting the biodiversity and climate crisis. And um, very simple, you know, our ecosystem is made out of multiple living beings, whether it's a tiny microorganism or whether it's an animal as big as a tiger. So all of that put together, including the birds, the bees, the butterflies, and the plants that we see make up our ecosystem. But why do we need to talk about that right now? And why is that so important? And I think what we have realized is the very important interlinkages that are there between the ecosystem and between our lives. What we are seeing is Today, like Michael mentioned, if we have the IPBES report where it, it, it's saying that humans are pushing a million species on the brink of extinction. And that is the largest extinction that we're going to see ever in the history of humankind. So we're actually doing activities, human activities, which are creating an imbalance within the natural ecosystem that we see. It's creating a mismatch where we're tampering with the balance that we had. We're tampering with what worked to keep this world in a beautiful habitable place like we see today. So what we need to ensure is that human activities do not coincide or do not sort of, uh, you know, deter the natural you know, balance that we have within the ecosystem. So just, quickly running over things, you know, we've, we've spoken about forests, we've spoken about the Amazon, we've spoken about food systems, on how all of that is very integrally linked to our climate crisis that we're seeing. But all of this put together, I think the biggest things that we have the most, uh, after our oceans, of course, is our forests. It's the simplest, most cost-effective solution to bring down carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and put it back into the soil from where it should be and all our industrial activity that has led to this excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over the past so many years, over the, since the Industrial Revolution. What we have started doing is we have started, you know, um, cutting down our far forests. We've started, uh, you know, basically putting our basic uh, breath, you know, our, our systems which hold us together, we've started playing with those and we've started actually playing with our life support systems. So what it does mean is that while, of course, it does affect the biodiversity of the area, if you like, and like Mirna said, you know, when the Amazon was on fire, it was a huge amount of biodiversity that was lost. And it's, sometimes it's incalculable. You can't really calculate the, the, the ecosystem services and the loss of biodiversity that comes with such a catastrophe. But what we do realize is that this messes with the balance. With, there, there have been studies where it says that if it is a rich biodiverse area, even the soil has higher capacity to take down carbon from the atmosphere. So we're even tampering with the capacity of the soil to bring down carbon from the atmosphere and sequester it into the ground. And when I did a study on wildfires in the high northern latitude area, so wildfires basically in uh, the tundras or in the uh, you know permafrost, sort of, like what happens to the permafrost when there are fires there? And there are studies which have shown that even despite uh, them being supposed, you know, supposedly cold areas, supposedly areas which are permanently frozen, which is why it's called permafrost. It leads to a lot of uh, output. Of course, as the permafrost melts, we're also seeing studies about how 
lots of gases have been released from the ground into the atmosphere, including methane, which is a very highly um, powerful greenhouse gas. Basically, it's, it's four times as powerful as, um, or even more than carbon dioxide. Uh, and the, the warming that it creates with the output of methane is a lot more harmful. So what we are seeing is that we are leading slowly towards a crisis of biodiversity extinction. We're, lead, we're, we're going towards a crisis where we're threatening human activities, threatening more and more species to go towards extinction. At the same time, we're seeing that human activity is also exacerbating the climate crisis. We're seeing that humankind, by the use of, um, you know, uh, since the industrialization, by the use of what we call so-called development, so-called use of fossil fuels, whether it's coal, whether it's natural gas, all of this has led to an increase in carbon dioxide, in carbon levels in the atmosphere, which is creating the climate crisis. So we, we're seeing two crises going towards each other and they're merging because of human activities. And the only thing that can change this is if we have a drastic shift in human activities, if we have a drastic shift in the way that we've been living our lives and the way that we've been developing our societies. What we can see, of course, is that what we need to do is ensure that as long as we can push these two crises from merging, as long as we can sort of just delay the, the time where it merges, because we're seeing with studies that it's getting more and more closer. We're seeing that we're losing out on very important, very precious time to fight, whether it's a biodiversity extinction or to fight something known as the climate crisis. And we, we all know the effects of the climate crisis, that it, it plays, it changes the weather patterns, it changes the way, um, you know, it sees, sees uh, the thermal flow of the sea, so whether the currents of the seas work. So basically it has a change in whether it's, you're talking about if there is a flood or a drought, it, it has a direct impact on the biodiversity of a, a place. And what we have forgotten is that we have forgotten that we have indigenous people, tribals, depending on where you are, it's called, uh, you know, there's, they're called different and in my hometown we call them Adivasis or tribals back in India. But we have seen that humans are living together with nature. Humans have been living together with nature. So it's not humankind that is the problem here. The problem is how we're actually developing our societies. The problem is how we're consuming. We have moved towards a system where it is in totally capitalistic in nature. We're moving towards a system where more is better, where newer is better. So we have forgotten the very basics about living within our resources. We've forgotten about living in harmony with nature. And we need, this is what we need to change. We need a drastic shift in how our economies have been functioning. And with the current, current COVID pandemic that the world witnessed, we saw something that we'd never thought we would ever see. We'd never seen the world go on a pause like we did. And while it has a huge impact on people's lives, on the economies, it has also given us a chance to restart our economies in a more sustainable manner and in a manner where we're not going back to a normal, where we normalize poverty, where we normalize greed and where we normalized inequalities, we normalized destructing the environment for development as a good. And what we're seeing is that the basic economic model, usually when we talk about economics, if there is an effect on the environment, it's always taken as an externality. And what we need to realize is that we need to internalize this externality because the environment is not separate from us. We cannot function in isolation from the environment. We have to learn, we have to move to an economic model where we are working in sync with the environment, where our resource consumption does not exceed what we can, the holding capacity of our planet. And we need to ensure that we're stepping up as individuals but also as nationally as governments and we're pushing our gov governments to do a lot more so i think that just brings me to the bit about you know we're all young people what can young people do and we've seen a lot of since the past year especially in the in the climate space we've seen young people going out on streets marching school strikes for climate but at the same time we're also seeing that more and more youth are stepping up we're also seeing that more and more youth are now realizing that it is their future that is at stake. And like we began the whole presentation talking about two youth constituencies and why we do what we do within our respective spaces in the UN. And I think what we have realized is that as young people, we cannot wait anymore for someone else to take the, to, to take the lead and make the change. We have to take the, take the steps ourselves. 
and what we can do is you know we don't have to go out with the goal of changing the world overnight because then it's going to be extremely hard and we're going to give up saying this is impossible but what we can do is take baby steps so begin individually in, as in my life or within my family or within my community within my my friends my relatives what changes can i make or how can i talk to people that will help them make these changes in their lives for example if you're consuming just but just notice um how much do you want a newer thing whether it's a newer phone because you know it's it's new it's out in the market has a better camera has whatever else it has or as simple as you know you go out with friends and you go to the mall you see something cute and you buy it and you come back home and what is the impact does that have while you know the mall is not the, the store is not going to run out of the cute top that you bought for example but what happens is you know right from where the cotton was sourced if it was a cotton cotton top or or a shirt for example right from where the cotton was grown the water and the energy that required for it to grow from the cotton to then get transported to get converted into yarn to get converted into cloth and the entire process from the cloth into the t-shirt into coming it into your store right next to your house the entire thing consumes a lot of water it consumes a lot of energy and it definitely the whole transportation process all of that has a massive intake of fossil fuels so without realizing with you know just by going out and buying the cute little t-shirt that i thought did no harm to anyone it actually has a larger impact on how much resources are being consumed so i think this is what we need to realize that every single action we do and every single thing that we use use consumes electricity consumes water consumes energy of course i'm not telling you to go back to nomadic times and not use anything we wouldn't be here giving this webinar without the technology that we have without me using my computer so while we do need to use resources while we do need to survive in a system or in an in, in an ecosystem that we've created for ourselves we also need to realize that we can't go back to living life like we you like we were um we can't go back to a system where we're needlessly consuming we're needlessly wanting new things or we're needlessly just buying and wasting and throwing out of the you know throwing into the bin something that we've used barely a couple of times and i think what what i'd like to end with is small success stories from people very uh, indigenous people living here within my country so there's a short story about um, there's a 29 year old boy called arun gaur who lived who lives in the western himalayas um and this is a very a story very recent so i'm not going back in the past 500 years or whatever but this is a, it, it is today's story and uh, he born and brought up in the mountains of the himalayas what he did was as uh, he was a young boy he started learning beekeeping of course because he lived in a in a system where they, they grew honey where they had bees so since he was a young boy he started learning beekeeping and eventually he's now an actual he he trains in beekeeping but along with this what he also realized was that he saw the importance of his natural lands he saw the importance of the forest and the the community around him and how the community his village and the forest were very interlinked and could not be separated from one another so what happened was at uh, he he has started within his community of course while they they are beekeeping while while the community is producing honey locally they have also started um, a very they, they started a tourism eco tourism method where there are tourists who come it's com completely community owned community organized they have home stays in the true sense not in the commercialized home stays that we are seeing online a lot of the times nowadays so there are actual actual home stays where people from outside people like me from the city can go there and live and understand their way of life live with the family in the village in the western himalayas what they also started doing is they started taking people for nature trails they started taking them for bird watching they started taking them to butterfly walks so basically immersing the people into a system into um, In, into the community and into the wildlife and into the forest around them in a way which is accessible understandable and helps them you know get a love towards it which will help you protect it because at the end of the day if you love something you're going to fight for it so it, only when you love your natural systems only when you love your forest around you only when you love your lands around you is when you're going to want to protect it and that's what he started doing he started and the entire village now survives on this ecosystem it's completely managed uh, by the ecotourism sorry completely managed by them um 
in a completely sustainable manner. But other than that, what, uh, what Arun also does is that he works with or he supports the forest guards. He supports the local forest guards. He, he goes on walks within the forest and he uh, alerts the forest guard if he's seen a poaching activity. Uh, he also, through this, sometimes because the, the government or the forest department has, um, you know, d does not have a trust within the community because the community doesn't trust them. They come as external, as external people within the forest where the community lives. So with this interaction, Narun has made the forest department and his community trust each other more. So the entire community now works together to protect the forest that is around the village. Even though this that doesn't necessarily fall under a protected area, it is a lot more biodiverse than protected areas alongside it. There are animals, birds, species that have been seen here because it has been naturally protected by the communities together with the forest guards. Um, who have, you know, so they've seen that, you know, working together has definitely benefited not just the community, but also the, the, the ecosystem around. And uh, to just put it very simply in Arun's words, he said, you know, that when you realize that you have the potential to make a change, you should definitely do that, put that in the larger well-being of, of the world, because if you're doing it only for yourself, it's extremely selfish and we're all here to live together with each other just sort of transfacing what uh, Arun was saying in Hindi. So I think I'd like to end on that positive note to see that there are success stories happening in our backyards while the government in India is actually very similar to what on the environmental side or very similar to what Brazil has been doing. We've, within the lockdown, we've, um, you know, leased out so many uh, environmental laws and we've, it's, it's, it's not even fun to talk about anymore because it's just so much as that we're seeing coming to us every day, different kinds of news about what the ministry is doing. But at the same time, we're seeing positive stories of change within the community by young people, whether they're educated, whether they're not. Um, I think each one of us have the potential in us to make the change. You, you do not need to be at a particular position in a particular organization to be able to make a change. So I'd just like to end with that. Thank you. Thank you, Hita. I think that was really nice. Uh, bringing it back to our backyards and our home, homeland is uh, something which really connects to everybody, uh, you know, personally. And I think all of you have been driving the uh, point about behavioral change and how we should change our behaviors as a key point that all of you have been mentioning through the presentations. Uh, and I think we should definitely have a little bit of a chat with everybody at the end. So from the chat, we've had a lot of positive messages for you, Hita, uh, for the great presentation you did. So congratulations. And I think we have one specific question directly towards you, uh, where we have uh, Smith who's saying that, uh, how do you think politicians look at wilderness as assets or relation or the relationships? I think... Um... I mean, talking very about politicians in India, I think they're definitely lacking to see the connection between um, wilderness and using them as assets. They're definitely seeing it as open space that can be degraded. They're seeing it as space which does not have any economic value, which is why it can be industrialized, it can be mined, it can be open for hydropower. Um, and we're definitely missing to see that link. And this is talking very locally about what I see in India. Of course, different countries are dealing with the situation very differently. But more or less, and I think it's a, it, and I, I can very safely make a generalized statement that I, until today, in most countries, we're not seeing the connect that we would between um, governments and protecting our natural systems. Um, while, of course, I mean, every, you know, local situation is very different. But, I mean, I, I could very safely say that we're still missing to see this as an e economic asset. And we really need to realize how do we bridge it to make it into I mean, how do we sort of monetize our natural systems without, you know, degrading them into uh, another project for industrialization? Mm -hmm. Would any of the panelists also want to take this up to give your context of this to this answer? Because uh, Hita has give, largely mentioned it from, you know, the South Asian point of view. Would any of the panelists want to explain how things are with the same question for the other uh, parts of the globe? Christian, maybe? Um, 
I like first of all, Hita and and also Mona. Thank you so much for the presentations. This was so enlightening to see. And sometimes when we're stuck in our own ways and trying to manage so many political processes, it's good to like get reminded what this really means. So thanks a lot for this. Um, I think one aspect that we didn't look at so far is the impact of not just our uh, consumption behavior, but also like um, the overall political responsibility that we all have. And I think Mona pointed at it when, when she spoke. Uh, there are two things that politicians care about, that's vote and that's funding. And when we look at the funding side of it, especially here in the Global North, uh, there is also a lot that we can do, especially when it comes to trade policy. Like uh, the EU is, for instance, currently negotiating a trade agreement with Mercosur, with a um, group of Latin American countries. And to my knowledge, the current trade agreement does not contain any safeguards for biodiversity. So I think it is important that if countries from the global north are trading with partners in the south, that we have strong safeguards for the environment included in it. And this is currently not the case. And I feel if you talk to maniac political leaders like Bolsonaro, the only language that they understand is unfortunately money. And I think um, here in Europe, we also have a responsibility to vote for politicians that go for strong trade agreements that ensure that the environment, biodiversity in particular, is being protected because um, this is the only way we can deal with, with maniac leaders like Bolsonaro or Trump for that matter. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. I think that well, it gives us like a different perspective on the same topic and how, you know, we can tackle things in different areas differently. Um, I think uh, like all your presentations, the way we've uh, talked about the different problems, I think you guys have clearly explained to us about what the climate crisis is all about, what the biodiversity crisis is all about. And now we would like to hear from Christian about some, one of the quick fix that has been popularly uh, advertised uh, as a solution to both the climate crisis and to some extent even for biodiversity. Uh, and this is about geoengineering. So uh, over to you, Christian, tell us, a bit more about how what is happening in this realm of geoengineering and is it really a solution? Krishan, you are muted. <laughs> Oops. Okay, thank you so much, Sweta. Um, I have to say right away, my presentation is going to be much more technical than what Hita and Myrna has presented. So I apologize if it's by far not as exciting, but it's still a very, very important issue. Um, before I go into the details of geoengineering, I just wanted to remind us all of, of a couple of facts that are really important to remember. Um, I think these are things that um, the people we're speaking to um, are all very well, um, well aware of, but there are a lot of people out there that sometimes tend to forget it. Um, climate change is a major for, um, for biodiversity loss, and it is predicted that it could even become the most important cause of biodiversity loss in the next 80 years. Um, these are all things that I think are very well known. We already talked about forest ecosystems and how much they are affected by climate change. There is another ecosystem that is luckily coming more into uh, the media spotlight, that's corals. Corals are also massively affected and most of the studies we have are clearly predicting that we're probably going to lose most of the coral ecosystems due to the warming of the oceans. Um, yeah, this is just like to summarize it, one in six species is probably going to go extinct uh, because of climate change. Um, but there are also a lot of other drivers of biodiversity loss that uh, we already talked about. Um, this is, we have um, a natural background rate of biodiversity loss. Uh, this is natural, this is completely normal that over time due to evolution, we're losing species. But right now, the rate that we're having is 100 to 1000 times faster than what it normally should be. And uh, Hita just like quoted a lot the, the IPBAS report that came out last year. And there was like this, this um, main line that they promoted that one million species is on the brink of extinction. And basically the time that I'm using to speak to you, 20 minutes is when one species goes extinct. And that does not include all the species that we have not discovered yet. So how does that relate to climate change? Um, here's a graphic from the most recent IPCC report um, and the scenarios that they're seeing. And in the uh, UNFCCC, we have an instrument that is called 
uh, the nationally determined contributions. And these are basically the patches that our countries are making on a mostly voluntary basis in which they specify uh, how they are going to mitigate uh, their CO2 emissions. And what you can see here is that um, what countries have pledged so far is definitely not sufficient to even keep the two degrees C target. And um, as you all know, uh, there is um, an emerging consensus that the two degrees C target is, is not sufficient, that we actually have to aim for 1.5 degrees. Um, or even less. So uh, with the current patches that we have from countries, we're moving towards the scenario in which warming could occur of at least 3.6 degrees um, by 2100. There are even other people that are saying it could go up to five degrees or even more. Um, so this is a huge problem that we're currently facing. Um, what is also relevant when we look at this is that the most recent IPCC report was uh, calculating its emission reduction um, trajectories based on the assumption that we can achieve something that we call negative emissions. And negative emissions is basically when we take CO2 out of the atmosphere, when we are um, absorbing more CO2 than we are emitting. And what you can see here in this graphic is that IPCC is assuming that we will probably have what we call an overshoot scenario in which for some period in time, we don't know for how long, we're going to be above uh, the level of emissions that we should have in order to keep the 1.5 or the 2 degree C um, emission reduction target. And in order to mitigate that, we would have to take out CO2. So um, all the assumptions in the IPCC are currently heavily based um, on the assumption that we will be able to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And there are currently two approaches that are being discussed. One is um, what has been in the media popularly called nature-based solutions. As the Global Use Biodiversity Network, we prefer uh, the term ecosystem-based solutions. Uh, there is a lot of talk about it at the moment. Um, a lot of people are questioning whether uh, nature-based solutions going to have the same fate like the Red Plus mechanism, something that is not really going to have a real-world impact. Uh, there is also a lot of greenwashing are going on when it comes to nature-based solutions. So it's very important that we follow this, that we uh, make sure that if we go for ecosystem-based solutions, that they're really uh, benefiting the whole system and are not just focusing on specific elements of, of, of nature-based solutions that are focused on CO2 absorption. So this is like uh, one approach, ecosystem-based solutions, uh, big debate about this. And the second, and that's what we're gonna talk about now, is the technological. Uh, perspective and that's geoengineering. So geoengineering can come in a lot of different forms and I will basically uh, describe to you what are the most important technologies that are currently being discussed and I think then we can also quickly conclude whether this is a true solution or a wrong turn that we could potentially go. Um, basically what geoengineering means is uh, that they are intentional large-scale technological manipulations of the earth systems and for short we call this techno fixes there are three main categories when it comes to geoengineering the first is solar radiation management or srm i'm going to explain this in a second then we have cdr for carbon dioxide removal and then um, eventually we have weather modifications. So these are the three main categories of geoengineering. Um, looking at the first one um, at SRM, solar radiation management, there are two uh, ways how this is being conducted. Uh, one, you can see this here in the picture, is marine cloud brightening, in which our chemicals are being sprayed into clouds in order to make them brighter. Um, with the intention that this is going to help to reflect more sunlight um, and uh, the additional emissions would then be absorbed by the ocean, leading to higher temperatures in the oceans, uh, which has a lot of detrimental impacts, especially on corals, but on also a lot of other forms of marine life. Um, another popular geoengineering technology is stratospheric aerosol injection. You can see this here, um, where you ha would have airplanes uh, flying over clouds in order to spray them so that they can rain off and all of this has um, effects on the wider ecosystem that we cannot predict we don't know what is going to happen uh, then we have uh, what is called ocean fertilization uh, which is basically a technology where ships would spray iron sulfate into the oceans 
uh, with the intention to make a phytoplankton grow and also support the absorption of CO2 in the oceans. Again, with uncontrollable um, effects on the wider ocean ecosystem. And finally, a, um, a technology that is being popularized at the moment is bioenergy carbon capture and storage, or BECCS for short, uh, which is another of these technologies that is highly uncertain. We don't know if it's ever going to work, um, but a fact for this is that we would have to change um, the system. We are growing uh, biofuels on land massively. We would have to, we would have to expand this. Um, and there is a high risk that this would especially happen in, in areas like in Latin America, but also in Southeast Asia and a number of those countries where we have very sensitive ecosystems that are super important for biodiversity. And there are assumptions that we could lose 90% um, of unmanaged forest ecosystems if we would convert this all into um, biofuel plantations. Uh, the problem is that the most recent IPCC um, report is actually focusing on this solution. They're assuming that this is something that can be applied on a great scale. But what is not being taken into account is that the uh, land change impacts of um, a massive expansion of biofuels would be much bigger than the climate benefits that could be created through this. And then the other problem is even if you would do this, so you would grow biofuels, you would then uh, use them as fuel for um, bioenergy power stations, and then you would absorb the CO2 and store it probably in the soil or somewhere. We have no guarantee uh, that um, all of this is not gonna be emitted at some point due to leakages or other problem. And the most important point here is that there is no practical application of BECCS so far. We don't know if this is even going to be functional, but a lot of scientists, a lot of parties um, are putting a lot of focus on BECCS. So that's a massive problem that we're facing. Uh, what is unknown um, quite widely is that the CBD actually recognized the risk of geoengineering already years ago. And um, in 2010 at CBD COP10, we adopted a COP decision that is establishing a de facto moratorium on geoengineering. You can see the text here. Um, and it is basically saying that no climate related geoengineering that would affect biodiversity shall take place. Uh, the problem is that we have a lot of countries that are um, either not aware of this or that are blatantly in breach of a decision that they all have adopted. And here you can see an example. Uh, this did not get a lot of media attention um, due to COVID-19, but just in the middle of April 2020, um, there was a huge um, experiment that took place in the Great Barrier Reef uh, with ocean fertilization. So you can see this here. This was financed by the Australian government, um, a party to the CBD. Um, they were using a loophole in this COP decision that allows for small scale scientific experiments. Um, but the problem is that a lot of um, actors, um, the Canadian government is another one, um, are trying to basically push for geoengineering solutions through the back door um, by conducting these small scale um, experiments. And we really don't know where this is going to lead to. So um, this is not just something out of a science fiction movie or a debate that is coming up and sometimes dying down. There are a lot of actors that have strong interest in that. And if we go back to my initial slide in which you can see um, the climate scenarios, uh, the big risk here is that we're probably going to have an overshoot, that we will emit more CO2 emissions um, than we should in order to keep um, our climate targets. And then politicians will have to look for a solution. So the risk that in the next couple of years, geoengineering is um, going to become this comfortable excuse and that people will um, basically present this as something where we have to decide. Do we want to protect our whole planet or do we want to protect biodiversity? Uh, this is like the propaganda that we're going to see and I think it is crucially important that we are aware that everything is connected and that we cannot just like um, manipulate the earth system hoping that we're going to protect it from climate change um, and ignoring the impacts this is going to have on biodiversity. So yeah, this brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much um, for your attention. I understand this is a rather technical topic um, and I only really touched the surface. If you're interested in that, I'm happy to send you more materials. Um, maybe we can also do a webinar where we focus uh, more in depth on geoengineering, um, but I hope this um, has made you aware that this is a threat that is still going on 
um, and that we will probably hear more about geoengineering in the coming years. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christian. And uh, to the last comment you made, I hope we hear less about it so that it's completely out and then we don't have to like fight another demon along with the bigger demons we are fighting with climate change and biodiversity loss. We don't have to fight this new thing which is uh, affecting us. And I think uh, Christian put it very nicely. I think it's really important for us to know that there is a, a, a sense of emergency which comes, which comes with climate and biodiversity crisis, but this sense of emergency does not mean that we can solve it with a quick fix. And any kind of quick fix always has a lasting uh, impacts on our ecosystems because uh, many of our panelists have already mentioned that we do not fully understand everything there is to know about the ecosystem and how the interconnections are made between species and things in our planet. So, you know, it's very important to think about these things much more carefully before you think of a quick solution, which seems like an awesome idea at first when you look at it, but in reality, it will have uh, you know, impacts which we can never imagine and might have very, very long lasting repercussions. And, you know, we being in a, you know, in a pandemic right now should remind us about the fact that we do not understand so many things about our planet and we should be more careful in the future because you never know what is going to happen and how your actions will have impacts. So, I mean, not ours per se, but actions that will be taken by our governments in the long term. And I think another topic which is connected with, with what Christian was talking about is synthetic biology and how that's also another topic which is being approached with the same uh, uh, concept of being a quick fix. Uh, do you want to just give a brief um, uh, overview about that also, Christian? Um, I'm, I'm really not an expert on, <laughs> on, on synthetic biology. Um, I think maybe we could uh, get an expert to talk mm -hmm. about it because it's very sensitive, it's very complex, and I think we really need to dedicate more time to it. But from what yeah. you just said, quick fixes are not going to solve it. Quick fixes is what politicians want to um, sell to a lot of people because it sounds like something easy, something good for our economy. But what we have to advocate for is a real transformational change that affects all the ways of how our economy is working, how our entire food system is working, how we consume, how we produce goods. We really need to look at um, this in a holistic way. And if we only focus on like technology as a solution for everything, uh, we're going to see that it's not going to work. But this transformational shift is not going to come from one day to another. We're really talking about a project here um, that is going to span over generations. We're talking about changes that need to be done, not just over 10 years, but over the next 30 or even 50, 80 years. So it's really something where we also have to realize that this is not just something that only we as young people can do by ourselves. This is something that needs to be done um, with, with, with every generation that is currently in a position to make political decisions, but also with future generations. So it affects our education system. It affects how we are connected to nature, all these kind of things. And um, as much as I would want this change like from one day to another, uh, and that's where technology seems such an attractive solution, we really need to realize that um, we're living in the Anthropocene and we, it, it, it will take generations for us to solve it, but we all need to focus on it one by one. Thank you, Christian. Uh, I think we would like to uh, open up the panel now for a discussion with our questions. We do have a lot of questions here, but I would like to give an opportunity to the people who are with us and have been patient enough to hear all the amazing talks that we had today. And some were quite technical, so thank you for being here. Uh, yeah, if anybody would like to speak up, please uh, like raise your hand and I can uh, allow you to speak, like I can uh, unmute your microphone for you. Okay. Uh, I think you'll be allowed to speak now, uh, Rahim. Hi, everyone. You can hear me? Uh, good morning. This is Rahim Smith from Grenada. Um, Christian, I just wanted to know which countries have led major uh, geoengineering projects? Um, there have been a couple. Um, what comes to my mind immediately is like the example that I have shown from Australia. Um, but there is also Canada, which has conducted a number of geoengineering experiments. Um, beyond that, it's rather small. Um, there have been some attempts by German scientists to conduct um, geoengineering experiments. So what you can see here is mostly countries in the global north, because if we would want to apply geoengineering and create profit out of it, it's something that big companies are going to do. 
Um, so I'm not uh, currently aware of any example from the global south where such an experiment was conducted. Thanks, Rahim. Uh, is there anybody else who would like to speak? You can just raise your hand and I can unmute your microphone. Okay. Carl, you're allowed to speak. Uh, I've unmuted your microphone. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, Kristen, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello? Yep, we can hear you. So, uh, um, so I think my question is, um, how can we highlight like uh, green wash washing of nature-based solutions to our governments because at least in like my country like nature-based solutions planting one million trees seem to be like the quick fix solution so how can we like highlight you know that um, we need to think more about these uh, solutions before we actually like implement them or sell them to like uh, people yeah yeah Christian um, I, I don't want to talk all the time, um, just a few points on that and then maybe um, others here from the panel can also comment on that. Um, I think the problem is not only nature-based solutions in themselves, the problem is what we make out of it. The problem is that we need a bigger debate um, in our societies about the planetary crisis that we're facing. And what you just pointed out is that governments are always trying to like um, select uh, one element and then present it as the solution for everything, like with nature-based solutions. Um, the problem is that we're living in a time where everything is incredibly complex. And a simple solution like nature-based solutions is not going to work. If we want to do nature-based um, nature solutions right, then we need to get it right. And that means not just focusing on, on, on nature, but on ecosystems as a whole. Because uh, the nature-based solutions that is good for the climate is maybe not good for the whole ecosystem. So when it comes, for instance, to, to tree planting, uh, the question is here, how are you planting the tree? What species are you planting? You know, if you just go on and you plant a lot of plantations, it's, it's not going to have um, a positive impact uh, for ecosystems in general, and that in turn will also um, dis uh, destroy a lot of the climate benefits that we could have. So we need to really think about it holistically. And I think um, we need to start a debate in which we question what are nature-based solutions and what are they not? What are the real solutions? Why do we need ecosystem-based solutions? Um, and I think the, the, the problem here is also um, one of like, like how the public is looking at it. Um, if we look back to Red Plus, for instance, like on paper, it looked like a good solution, but then in reality on the ground, it didn't make so much of a difference, quite the opposite. So we have to make sure that the same is not going to happen to ecosystem-based solutions by having critical and open dialogues. Thank you. <laughs> um, Maybe, Myrna, you could also comment on that like from, from a more Global South perspective, because I think in your region, nature-based solutions are also quite important. Yeah, they are. They are, but uh, yeah, it's it's very important to to be careful about uh, what approach is being taken and uh, if it is being labeled as nature-based solutions, but uh, it is not that much, and it is more of something of a greenwashing intervention. And then it is very important to be careful. That's why I also think that ecosystem-based solutions would be more of a secure <laughs> approach uh, due to the yeah the, the bad management of the terminology of nature based solutions that has been happening lately sadly uh, and uh, and yes uh, the, i think that's something uh, important for the global south is that uh, we have some of the most uh, biodiverse ecosystems and um, some of the most um pristine uh, areas, which are more vulnerable to any kind of intervention. So uh, the impacts of interventions like geoengineering or massive uh, monocultural plantations or tree plantations without any uh, strict planning behind uh, can be way more uh, complex to manage afterwards, especially for countries. Uh, 
that have very little a uh, human resources and budget and budget to manage a uh, the bad results after uh, are not very well planned the intervention thanks Milna. we have two more people who would like to speak and then we can uh, start moving on to the written questions uh hassan yeah i've, unmu I've uh, unmuted your microphone Thank you, Sweta and our team. Uh, uh, what I would like to ask is uh, some state, fragile states like us in Somalia, uh, major loss of biodiversity is due to deforestation. And uh, people use this deforestation as a source of uh, uh, economic, for example, they export the charcoal or the charcoal mainly is used within the, uh, the country as a uh, fuel. Uh, how can be uh, these people be uh, campaign or uh, change the mind of uh, getting away from deforestation and using other sources of uh, economy. Thank you. Thank you for that, Hassan. Um, would somebody want to uh, respond to what Hassan mentioned? Okay, thanks, Hassan. I think okay. we have one. Yeah, please. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and yes, uh, all the all the policies oriented towards biodiversity conservation have to take into account first the local communities and the benefits that they uh, take from nature. Most of the times, uh, local con communities, indigenous communities, and uh, small uh, stakeholders. Uh, make a sustainable use of the forests. So most of the traditional charcoal production uh, was sustainable and uh, it doesn't uh, have the biggest impact on the forest, uh, on the forest loss. Uh, the problem is when it gets uh, to the mega industry levels. But uh, in any case, I think that uh, the, the ways of supporting the communities uh, are not to, to banning the practices that have been held for years, but incentivize it, incentivizing um, uh, economic activities that are more in line with the living in harmony with the ecosystem that provides them the services that they need. Uh, I think that there are many uh, non-timber resources of the forests that are not uh, explored into their full potential. And that is something that governments are not putting enough resources and uh, enough research into and uh, and this is something that needs to change because if we don't uh, push the the right incentives for the communities to to live in the forest and uh, have the resources that they need to have a decent livelihood then it is impossible to ban them to do things and again they are not the major uh, drivers of forest loss anyway Thank you, Milna, for that. Um, Shah, uh, if you have any comment from your side, I think that's the last hand I see up here. Uh, after you speak, I'll, I'll start moving on to the questions we have. You, I've unmuted your microphone, Shah. Yes, uh, hello to everyone. Uh, good talking, uh, very informative talking. Uh, so uh, here in North Pakistan, uh, our country, how can we uh, relate uh, biodiversity with local masses? Because uh, local masses play a great role in conservation of biodiversity. So what are those aspects uh, which uh, have to follow the local masses in terms to uh, conserve the biodiversity? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, who would like to take this question, guys? Yeah, I can go for this. Mm -hmm. I think, I think the first thing is just to help the people understand their relation with the biodiversity around them, because it's very important for us to understand why we want to save something that we're talking about. Because if that first initial connect is lacking, there's going to be no sort of motivation. So I think that the first thing is just to make your community aware of what is around them, how their lives are interdependent on 
whether it's, uh, you know, whatever biodiversity is around, whether it's a forest which is a little further away or, you know, whatever topic that you're talking about, to sort of bridge the difference. Because sometimes when we live in cities, our lives are so separated from the natural world and they're so um, caught up in the, you know, hustle bustle of our daily life that we really need to uh, lose this connect that we have. And I think the first thing is just to sort of help people bridge the connect. And only then will they realize its importance about how our food comes not from the heart of the city, but from outside. How um, basically everything that we need to survive on is brought out from outside of the city, not from, not from the city center. So uh, I think it's just important to sort of bridge the, the gap between these two before we can work on anything after that. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Hina. Uh, thank you. I think we have a few questions for uh, Marie, and uh, maybe after that we could like. Uh, I mean, for, I, I mean, I think she needs to leave. So once she leaves, if somebody else wants to say something else, they can. Uh, but uh, I'm going to get directly to her questions. I think the one of the first questions we have for you here is about: uh, mm -hmm. Do you think we can change the commercial uh, farming sector to be more environmentally friendly? And I think with connection to this, I think the large, the bigger question is about. How are you going to uh, tackle the debate where every time you, people talk about why we need to commercialize, do mass agricultural practices versus the hunger uh, argument? Because everybody would say, you know, we need to feed our people and therefore there is hunger and poverty and therefore you need to have this kind of mass pr uh, production of food to be able to satisfy those needs. So maybe you could answer those two together. Yeah, 40% um, of the today's uh, food production is wasted, so there is simply no use for it. So it's simply a ridiculous argument to say that with a regenerative and sustainable way of agriculture, we cannot feed the planet. If we just stop wasting 40% of food, um, we have like so much food for everyone and we can really, uh, yeah, like feed like the whole planet. And um, as well, um, it always depends on the on the time frame. If you look for maybe like three years, then of course a very extractive agriculture is more, you can extract more from the soil. But what after these three years? If you don't need any like food after three years, okay, then you maybe have a win. But if you want to still eat from the same soil after three years, then it will be like decreasing. You need a lot of very expensive pesticides. Um, you are very, in the, you're very um, um, dependent on big um, companies um, who charge a lot for all the different like crops and the, the different um, fertilizers and everything. So um, when we say like, okay, we look on a longer term um, and want to bring the, like earth in balance, then of course um, we need to we need to shift. And also maybe something would like when we talk to all the older generation, um, like for them, like a sustainable agriculture was normal. This only changed in the last few years. Also, like I'm now 23, so I grew up already with a very extractive um, and like also with a lot of um, machines and a lot of packaging and, and everything like this is, this is like how I grew up and this is like what I know. But when we only talk to our parents or to our grandparents, their reality of agriculture looked very, very different. And of course, yes, we are way more people now, but as I've already mentioned, if we get over, um, yeah, not wasting that much food, we can um, overcome all of these challenges at once. Thanks for that, Rahit. I think that was the, per the perfect answer to that question. Uh, sorry, uh, Marie, <laughs> that was the perfect answer to that question. I think the next one we have, I'm trying to go quickly through some of the questions so that we don't, we have you for those. Uh, what are the indicators that can be used locally to measure the impact of agriculture on the environment, like the ecosystem, la water and land, and where can I find it? Well, this should be monitored probably by the government. Uh, so if there is an agriculture department or a biodiversity department, but if it's not well um, like monitored, it might be good to get in contact with some NGOs who do local monitoring. Um, so it can be measured with, uh, for example, the like how fertile the soil is, um, how many am animals you find uh, per um, square um, per square or cubic meter. Um, it can also be measured with like how clean the water is. Um, so there are a lot of different measurements. It really depends on what you want to find out. But I would advise you first to check the governmental page maybe agriculture or um, the, the web page on, um, on on environment or something like this or maybe forestry sometimes as well depends where you, where you live and otherwise maybe you have a, a big environmental NGO maybe WWF um, who you could 
go first and maybe you can even find some networks of local farmers also maybe farmers who specialize on regenerative farming and yeah these are like some advice but it really depends which country you're from thank you for that uh, Marie. i think uh, the next one i think can be open to everybody else so uh, yeah if uh, Marie, you need to leave so thank you so much for being here uh, we just wanted to have a quick picture with everybody here so <laughs> maybe we could take that now Let me just make the gallery view. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thanks, Mary. Uh, so, guys, the next question we have here is about um, uh, the uh, uh, yeah. What best can uh, what best can you advise past pastoralists to manage the number of li livestock that one should own to achieve climate action, bearing in mind that this is deeply infused in their culture. Can any of you take this question? The question on livestock. Marie, maybe you might be the best one to answer this one too. Sorry, now I missed the question because I was just typing my contact details. Sorry, yes, I can take no it. No problem. So the question they've asked is, uh, how can you advise pastoralists to manage the number of livestock that they own uh, so that they can actually achieve climate action because of the fact, I mean, bearing in mind the fact that this number of livestock is uh, kind of connected to their culture. Yeah, maybe also to say here that when we talk about um, livestock and, and um, as well cattle farming, the very local, um, like if there is like a family who has maybe like three cows and they're like grazing, this is not the problem per se. Of course, they also um, emit methane, but this is not the major contribution to 14.5% um, uh, of global tree, um, greenhouse gas emissions. But what is the problem is this very um, industrialized um, cattle farming, where you have like, as you have been seeing on my picture, like like thousands and millions of cows. Um, so this is the problem, right? So if there is a local community and they have like three cows, like oh, this is not the problem. So this is, can actually be even good for some, for some other process, for some other biodiversity um, processes with like the fields and everything. So what we have to fight is the agriculture, uh, the industrialized agriculture farming, um, and there especially the um, agriculture, uh, uh, the industrialized um, livestock farming. So. Yeah, if there is like a family with some cows, like don't blame them for the climate crisis. Thanks, uh, Marie. Uh, so the next question we have uh, is to Milna. Uh, they want to know, can we predict future fires on the basis of probability? Well, we cannot uh, totally predict forest fires on extension, we can uh, predict the periods where we are going to have them. We can uh, predict uh, a little bit of uh, uh, the, on, on how many hotspots we are going to have based on what we had on the previous years, but it's based uh, on many, many factors. It's, uh, it has to do with the uh, climate uh, uh, behavior of the year. It has to do with the, especially with the national policies, uh, and uh, the deforestation uh, practices. Uh, so there are many impacts. There is also a, a role that chance plays. So we are, uh, there is not a possibility to be sure on, on the impact, but, but we can be sure that we will have them and they will be similar to what has happened in the last years. Okay, the next one we have, thanks, Mena. The next one we have is from Esteban, who's talking about action. Uh, this question is from, uh, from Gibbon, Mexico chapter in alliance with the S SDSN Youth Mexico. We want to, we want to join uh, into the younger working groups. Uh, we already joined the working WA working uh, groups and read the strategies in the uh, Google Drive, but there is no clear agenda or leading. Uh, which working group has uh, co has no coordination and what's the next steps to get active in these groups so i think this is a question to yango from the gibbon chapters on how they can get active mm -hmm. 
So as Hita mentioned in the beginning, that we are um, getting super active during the sessions and sometimes, especially if there is no um, technical meeting or expert meeting, then it's sometimes a little bit hard to keep up all the energy. Um, but nevertheless, as Hita also mentioned, we are a flag structure. Um, everyone should feel empowered to start something. So whenever you have a good idea, um, feel free to just post in the chat, like organize a call, um, get some people behind you, share with the mailing list, with the Facebook group, and yeah, get started. Um, so yeah, you don't have to wait for, for, for someone to start. There is also no um, leader or something. So yeah, feel free to, to start something. But yeah, also like when we go in the lead up to a COP, which is unfortunately only happening not, yeah, late next year, so in November, um, it takes a while. So we can organize webinars like we have here. Um, we can draft policy paper, we can try to feed it in the NDCs as Christian mentioned. Um, so there are like so many possibilities. Yeah, feel empowered to get something started. Yeah, I think this is a great opportunity and a beginning of a good rela uh, uh, working relationship, a more active relationship between the two constituencies. And if there are more chapters that are interested in this, we can definitely find more ways and opportunities for engagement and uh, more active plans that can happen. But as Marie said, you know, if you have an idea, just bring it out there and, you know, both the constituencies can support you to ensure it happens. Uh, the next question we have is, I think a few of these have already been answered, but one of them we have here is about how can we reduce deforestation either intentionally or naturally worldwide? And how, the, how can youth play a role regarding deforestation? Um, I think that should go to Myrna. Um, I think we highlighted already everything. Um, Consumption, production, uh, trade deals, these are all some factors that play a role. Uh, being aware of like uh, political institutions, political figures that play a role in this, um, I think are very important. Um, and I think the most important thing that you can do is not to close your eye for this. Like always try to think in a connected way. Do not look at just one fire. Uh, there are a lot of connections with it. Look at the whole socioeconomic system. Look at, um, the, the social situation in which people are living, look at uh, what is forcing or what is driving companies to uh, push for deforestation, look at the actors, look at companies in your country uh, that, are, that have subsidiaries or are active in, in countries where deforestation is a big issue. Look at, for instance, German companies that are investing in Brazil, look at what companies they have and uncover it. You know, if you, you, we have access to social media, so you can like post about this with your friends. You can try to make, you can do um, a session about this in your school, in your university. Uh, there are a lot of things that you can do, but make sure that this is something uh, that that stays in the media spotlight and something where people understand that we um, all have a stake in this, and the deforestation has as much to do with the products that we're buying. Um, the political parties that are in power, the companies that are benefiting from it, um, as it is an issue in the countries where it is appearing. Sorry, I think Mona can, can go into more detail. <laughs> no, what you said is perfect. Thank you. Uh, so just to complement what Christian said, I think that it is very important to, to take action at all the possible levels. So uh, you can and you have to push your governments again, if you are in the global north, to block the trade agreements that are incentivized in the deforestation in the global south on the biodiverse countries. Uh, in, if you are in the global south, uh, try to push for effective laws uh, so that uh, this kind of perverse policies are not taken. Uh, on, your, on the personal level, uh, try to check your consumption. Uh, and it is super important not also to try to not consume what you don't need, or what uh, you know that it's coming from exports that are incentivizing deforestation, but also to try to do consume things that are supporting the conservation of the forest. Uh, this is something super important because uh, in this way you are supporting the local uh, stakeholders uh, and you are giving them you are giving them a way to go out of the of the traditional scheme of I have this portion of lands. And in order to educate and raise my children, I will have to, to cut and sell the last trees that are remaining in my, in my portion of lands for a very cheap price to the illegal uh, loggers, for example. 
uh, and you're giving them the opportunity to do something better because for what I have seen uh, during my years of work with uh, local communities is that people in the communities are not very happy about <laughs> having to cut their trees because they see their trees as something as their savings. Like they, they, they say that I have this cow battery, for example, for 20 years. And this is a, my insurance that if my child has to go to university and I need some money, I can cut it and sell it. But they prefer to not do it. So if there is a way for them uh, that incentivizes to like um, label and export the locally produced jam uh, from fruits that are uh, taken from the forest and they don't have to lose the resources to do that because there are fruits that they collect every year, they will obvi obviously prefer to do this. But there is not enough support to these kind of initiatives. And the support from these kind of initiatives comes from the governments, but also comes from the demands. So if you start looking from these kind of products and try to like pay some more if you can to have a locally produced uh, and uh, sourced the uh, forest sourced jam instead of the commercial jam that you find on the supermarket, please do it. Try to do it. You have no idea on the impact that is that this is going to have on the lives of the people that are actually taking care of the forest. Yeah, thank you, Mim. I think you really wrapped it up very well with talking about locally sourced stuff, the behavioral change, everything possible. Uh, I think we had a really good discussion today. Thank you guys for being there for such a long webinar. Uh, we do have one last question, but I don't know if we have the expertise here to answer it. The question here is about how youth could get connected to agroforestry support given. Um, this is from Ibrahim. I don't know if we have anybody to answer this, but uh, I can just ask you guys if you can you know anything that you could uh, answer to this question for um i'm not sure if i'm fully understanding the question so ibrahim you want to know um, what support can be provided for young people that want to um, carry out agroforestry projects is, is that what you mean maybe we can unmute him so they can give us a bit more background Ibrahim, ah, I'm yeah. oh, hello all uh, my name is Ibrahim Inusa and uh, founder of uh, nature conservation advocate for climate initiative and member of global youth biodiversity network so my question really goes like uh, to agroforestry ponds and uh, youth doing thing on things on agroforestry. Actually, my organization is 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 planning a project to empower a, a village with agroforestry by planting ten thousand trees. So we are planning this thing, but not exactly knowing where directly to go to while sourcing for our ponds so uh this this is the question i is it is, is it clear is my question clear yeah oh thank you um would any of us be able to answer this question or comment on it um sorry in addition uh we are planning to, uh the project is on a uh, six hectares uh of land thank you so we have gathered all the legals and uh, the the procedures and uh, total people that are going to benefit from this project so and we are still working on it thank you Thank you, Ibrahim. Um, congrats, uh, great work on the project, and I hope you guys get to a, a more successful, I mean, uh, be more successful as well in the future. So great work already. Um, so guys, in case there's anything else from the panelists, I think we can call this uh, amazing um, webinar to an end. Maybe just to respond to Ibrahim, um, congratulations on this project. It sounds really amazing. Six hectares, where I come from is a lot and it's not easy to secure. Um, I'm not an expert on this. Um, I know funding is an issue for all of us. Um, and from what I understood, you're 
you're still looking for like potential partners that could help you with this. Uh, from my perspective, there are a lot of um, development agencies active also in Nigeria. Uh, from Germany, I know there is GIZ, there is also KFW, uh, which is a bank. And I think what you can do is you can check the, the websites of these organizations to see if they have an office in Nigeria. For GIZ, I know they do. Um, and you could check if you if there is a way to contact them by email or by phone or by, by going to the office to figure out if there is any uh, project line um, through which they provide funding that could be extended to your project. Uh, that would be one angle. Um, another angle that you could follow would be the Global Environmental um, Facility, the GEF. Uh, they also have a small grants program. I think you can Google that, um, GEF Small Grants Program. It's not easy to access, unfortunately, especially for youth organizations, uh, but they have uh, national committees in most countries. I'm not sure about Nigeria, but, but just check their website. And through this program, they are um, also providing funding for, for small scale projects, um, but it has to be approved by the national committee in your country. So you could check this out. Um, another option would be to check what uh, bigger NGOs are active in your area, WWF for instance, or uh, Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace, like all these kind of organizations sometimes have local offices and they sometimes have some funds that are more easy to access and through which they also support local projects. So um, maybe start with mapping the organizations that are active in, in your area and who could potentially have some funds. Uh, and then try to get in touch with them. And um, I understand it's not an easy process and probably going to take a while, but I wish you the best of luck for it. And again, congratulations for securing so much land for, for, for such a good project. Maybe if I can compliment what Christian said. Uh, yeah, first, congratulations on, on this project because it is not easy to to work on agroforestry and support and empowering local communities, but I think is one of the best approaches uh, to work on ecosystem restoration because uh, at least you are ensuring that uh, local communities have a uh, local sources of uh, more diverse and nutritious food. So this is very important. Uh, I think that uh, first it is important to go through uh, the funding channels that Christian mentioned. It. Uh, Besides GIZ, I think uh, what I, the organization I was working on was supported by BOSS Plus, which is a Belgian initiative that also supports a forestry, a agroforestry projects in the Global South. Maybe you can check that one. But also I would suggest to try to uh, reach the private sector. I think that there are many uh, private companies that are uh, looking for sources to, to develop their green uh, responsibility. Uh, part like the the social responsibility they try to focus it on on more on something more a uh, green and sometimes they fall into traps of a uh, projects that are not that meaningful for example uh, many air, airline companies uh, say that they are going to to outsource their their carbon emissions by these uh, projects of tree plantations, but most of the times the tree plantations are not considering native tree species. They only consider the plantation phase and they don't consider the monitoring of the, of the forest that is uh, supposed to be grown. And at the end, they are not meaningful at all. So it will be interesting to approach these kind of uh, companies to show them that you have a, a more interesting project with a far more, um, it's a large scale of uh, results, and that would be something potentially more attractive for them as well. Thanks, Lena. Uh, so thank you everyone for being there for this uh, amazing webinar. We had some really interesting discussions and thank you for all the questions you guys had. Uh, I mean, we are all here, we are, we are a community here who's really active and would like, has been doing a lot of work at the political level as well as, you know, uh, at, on creating awareness. So in case any of you are interested in doing more and getting more active on any of the topics that you guys heard about today or anything else, uh, please brief, uh, feel free to reach out to both Given as well as to Yango. And I'm sure we'll be more than happy to ha help engage with you guys and, you know, create something bigger. So I think we had just one last comment. Yeah, thank you for everything, guys. So thank you for all the lovely panelists here and everybody who's attended it. Um, I hope you guys have a great day going forward. 
any last words from our panelists before we end the webinar? No, I think this was great. Thank you. And we look forward to working more closely between both the constituencies. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Cool, guys. Then, uh, Christian, Armina, do you have any last words? Ah, cool. <laughs> Not really. Thanks for the opportunity of uh, sharing some views. Mm -hmm. And we will be super happy to be engaged. So feel free to come to us if you have any more questions. Thanks, guys. So take care, and I'll be ending the webinar now. So thank you so much for everybody who was here. Uh, I hope you have a great day and a great weekend. Bye. Bye.